Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. A new report has been released measuring environmental inequality. Researchers looked at industrial air pollution exposure in the United States across all 50 states and compared exposure based on race and economics. The report is titled Three Measures of Environmental Inequality. Now joining us is one of the authors of the report, Clara Zwillick. She is a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute for Ecological Economics at Vienna University in Austria, and she worked in tandem with the University of Massachusetts Amherst Political Economy Research Institute on this report. Thank you for joining us, Clara. Thanks for inviting me, Jessica. So, Clara, your report measured environmental inequality. First of all, just define for us what that is, and, and how do you measure something like that? So, um, concerning the measurement here at uh, Perry, we're fortunate to have access uh, to very high quality data on industrial air pollution exposure. So for over 15 million tiny grid cells covering the entire United States, we have a measure of pollution exposure. And we combine these data with income and sociodemographic data, also at a fine spatial resolution, to look at who is disproportionately affected by pollution exposure. And yeah, then we calculate some inequality measures based on these data, and we do some um, all sorts of statistical analysis. Okay, so what did some of those statistical analysis, uh, what came out of it? What were some of the most alarming findings? So, I mean, we find consistently that poor people and minorities are disproportionately affected by pollution exposure. And um, now we're doing studies, uh, we're doing analysis at the national level. Um, and you could say, Maybe these national level results don't tell a lot about uh, local disparities because um, poor people and minorities generally live in the more polluted regions of the country as a whole. Um, now, when you then look at disparities only within cities or within regions, you find that um, the results hold. And in some cases, they tend to be even stronger. For example, um, this is especially uh, true for Hispanics, who generally um, live in the cleaner parts of the country as a whole, like the Southwest. But within uh, the regions and cities, they live in the more polluted neighborhoods. African Americans, by contrast, both live in the more polluted regions, as well as in the more polluted neighborhoods within cities and regions. You also look specifically at industrial air pollution. What is special about industrial air pollution? And, and compare that to other environmental disparities. So first of all, what is important about air pollution is that it is a huge um, environmental health risk and that uh, there's a growing understanding that it has been um, seriously underestimated in the past. According to a study by the World Health Organization, now one in eight global deaths um, are related to some form of air pollution. Um, so they say that uh, air pollution is now the world's largest single environmental health risk. And there are other studies by the International Monetary Fund or the European Commission largely confirming these findings. So now industrial air pollution, um, the data we're having um, on the um, over hundreds of chemicals um, that uh, are emitted from the toxic facilities uh, only accounts for a small part of this. But what is interesting about this it is, is that it is um, on the one hand very unequally uh, distributed, but this distribution is not something natural, but it's the outcome of political struggles and uh, past regulations, etc. Now, clearly, you'll have more air pollution in, from heating in places that are colder, or you'll have more air pollution from cars and trucks in places with higher population density. But, um, and it's really hard to target these, um, but for industrial air pollution, it's very easy. Um, because you can, for example, include environmental justice considerations for the siting of new facilities, or you can um, install scrubbers that filter out some of the most um, hazardous chemicals. And these things are sometimes very small changes for the firms with huge positive impact for neighborhoods. All right, and you've been able to do all this because you guys actually had the data on industrial air pollution. But there are other forms of pollution where we just don't have that kind of data. What, what would you need in order to assess other forms of pollution? 
The data limitation is a serious problem. Some databases um, that the Environmental Protection Agency has on air pollution have not been updated for a very long time. Other databases just, uh, or in generally, um, greenhouse gas emissions and non-greenhouse gas emissions are not covered in the same databases. So we can not really address some really important research questions. But there's some even more, um, there are some even more serious problems when it comes to disclosure, especially as far as new environmental hazards are concerned. So uh, for example, fracking. Fracking is exempt from the main um, environmental regulations in the United States, um, and including laws on chemical disclosure. So what happened is that states stepped in to regulate fracking, but unsurprisingly now regulation very strongly across states. Some states have very generous uh, exemptions of disclosure for companies um, because companies can declare some uh, chemicals they release as trade secrets. And in some states, uh, timing of disclosure um, is very late. So what can happen is that neighborhoods are already exposed to pollutants for a significant time span before they actually um, learn about this. Clara, besides just getting more disclosure, what other policies would you recommend for the United States government to, to take in order to reduce environmental disparities? Well, we need to include um, distributional considerations into environmental policy and environmental considerations into economic and social policy. Um, currently, uh, market-based environmental policy mechanisms such as emissions trading regimes are very um, popular amongst policymakers, and the rational, especially for reducing um, carbon emissions. And the rationale here is that um, for climate change, um, it doesn't matter where one unit of emissions um, takes place because it has the same negative climate impact everywhere. So the rationale goes that um, basically. Uh, emissions reductions should be achieved where it is easiest to do so um, and market forces are allowed to basically um, solve this in the most cost efficient way. Now there's a serious problem with that. Um, the burning of fossil fuels not only uh, pollutes, um, not only contributes to climate change, but also pollutes the air locally. Um, there's a growing literature on air quality co-benefits of carbon reductions that recognizes this. Now, if we do have um, other benefits from reducing carbon emissions, including improved air quality, then it really matters where uh, emissions reductions are achieved. So distributional considerations become very important. Um, and it's important to keep these in mind in an environmental policy. All thank right, you. Clara Zwickel, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks very much for the invitation. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.